Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the special program that we are hosting here at the World Affairs Council. Uh, we, before we introduce our uh, guest speaker and our guests and our moderator, um, I want to let you know that this program is happening because of the support we receive from the World Affairs Council of America. There are six other programs having to do with uh, U.S.-German relations uh, entitled Engage America uh, and uh, in, in other cities across the uh, country. Uh, we, the World Affairs Council of America is uh, uh, pleased to have this continuation of the partnership with the uh, Guthen Institute uh, for a Wunderbar Together USA 2020 grant series. The aim of the series is to convince um, or convene rather high level speakers uh, for public forums such as this one on Engage America, what 30 years of a reunited Germany means for transatlantic relations in the world. Uh, this program is hosted in partnership with Wunderbar Together and the World Affairs Council's of America, and we were just talking offline, the Baker Institute recently had a program, a very special program, and the Consul General Meister was on there, uh, the former Secretary of State James Baker and Chancellor Merkel, and uh, we will, uh, we will uh, post that in the chat room here in a few seconds, so you could view that. Don't view it now, because we want you to watch this, but if you could uh, save it and view it later, uh, it's an extraordinary discussion uh, about uh, the uh, uh, U.S. and Germany relations. Um, first, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the people on the panel today. Uh, we are very humbled and honored to have uh, the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, Thomas Meister. His uh, region is not only Texas, it covers Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico and Oklahoma, which is a large area, um, and we are very grateful to have him represent uh, Germany and, uh, and be here in Texas. He's been very kind and generous with his time and also has visited San Antonio several times. Um, he has been involved in, uh, in government for many years and uh, being the Consul General in New York and had uh, uh, was also of service in, U in Uganda and Spain and Brazil and was the ambassador to New Zealand and more recently the ambassador to Iceland. So we welcome General Consul Thomas Meister uh, as our special guest and we will hear from him in a few seconds. Next we have uh, Jameson Braun um, who has recently relocated uh, to San Antonio of all places. He was living in Germany prior to that. He was the, the former chief of staff and senior military advisor to Ambassador Sterling at headquarters of the U.S. European Command. And he has spent the last 22 years uh, working through the Department of the Air Force. And uh, he is considered a, a truly global leader. Um, and he holds three graduate degrees in business systems an, uh, analysis and international strategy and as a recipient of the Defense Superior Service Medal and Disney Innovation Award. Uh, very impressive biographies here. And um, we uh, welcome everyone to the program. And their biographies are actually also listed in the chat room as well. Um, and last but not least, I want to introduce the moderator, uh, John J.J. Casey. He is a World Affairs Council board member. Um, he's a novelist. Uh, he's a pilot. He's a veteran. He has also served as a military diplomat at the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, uh, a veteran combat airlift and test pilot, um, and has worked in international affairs uh, uh, as a strategist at the U.S. embassies in Germany and Ethiopia at the Pentagon. And his website, which I highly recommend you check out, is johnjcasey.com. 
and I'm really looking forward to this program. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to John to start it up. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks a lot, Armin. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone who is watching the program uh, today. I think uh, we've got uh, a great panel for you today, certainly with uh, uh, Consul General Meister and uh, retired Colonel Jameson Braun. Um, I'm not gonna speak too much except to maybe uh, attend a few of the questions from you. You can put those, as Armin mentioned, into the Q&A. Uh, and uh, in between uh, their, their uh, discussion, uh, I'll try and work those in. Uh, but what we'd like to start with Consul General uh, Meister, who I believe has a short video uh, and then a, a presentation to show us that is specifically about the importance and history of German Unity Day. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Consul General Meister. Okay, thanks a lot, JJ. Thank you a lot, Armin, and thanks for the invite. And Armin, if you're so kind to present the video to us, it's just a one minute video. All right. Did you all see a visual on the screen or no? No. We right. just saw the picture, but not the video. All right. I think, uh, I think you'd, you'd try it one more time. Just press play, see if it works. I did see it come up. All right. There we go. You know, you try this, you try this several times and it works. And then just when you want to try it, it doesn't. All right. But here it is. Tell me, let me know when it's all, uh, when you could see it. Okay. Good. Thanks a lot. So as you saw, this was a video by my foreign office um, on the 30th anniversary of Germany's unification. And uh, I have uh, four points that I'd like to cover in my uh, brief presentation. Uh, one is a, to, to quickly run through you through the process of German unification. Uh, secondly, the international framework. Thirdly, the so-called Aufbau Ost, which means the reconstruction of East Germany, and number four, item four, would be the uh, socio-political aspects of German unification. And now starting with um, the uh, German unification process and the path to German unity. Uh, it was on 9th November 1989, as many of you might remember, that uh, the Politburo, East German GDR Politburo member Schabowski said, and I quote, to implement a regulation today that allows every citizen of the GDR to leave through the border crossing of the GDR, end of quote. This is the famous important sentence. Uh, and we were rubbing our eyes and we thought we wouldn't believe it, but it was true. It was the de facto opening of the wall. Uh, 
whether it, he was uh, authorized to say so at this very moment is a different question, but it happened and that moment practically the wall came down. So many stories about that. One of my stories is uh, that when I served in New Zealand uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, we celebrated the, uh, the 20th anniversary obviously of the fall of the wall and uh, we invited Chris Patton, the former governor of uh, Hong Kong and the EU commissioner. And he at the time was in London uh, uh, on that very day uh, at a speech of a British expert on Central Europe. And this uh, older gentleman said, you know, there's something going on. Uh, we might see uh, the wall coming down, perhaps not during my lifetime, but then he looked at the students in front of him and said, but, but during your lifetime, Germany might be reunited. And that very moment, somebody opened the door, came in and said, so uh, the wall just came down. So that's the way how unexpectedly it happened. But it's a lifetime, uh, an event in your lifetime that you will always remember and then we had a, a, a movie festival again in Wellington New Zealand at the time and I do remember the, um, uh, the, the famous German um, uh, director Christian Schwochel and he presented his movie about East Germany He's himself East German and he was also he said I'm always asked where were you when the wall came down and he said well I was in bed like every 11 year old at the time and then we realized okay we're getting older now so it's, uh, but uh, it is a very historic moment that um, I think none of us will forget when we, we think back of the very important uh, events that happened during our lifetime. Um, now, to, on the process, uh, on November 28, Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor, presented a 10 point plan to overcome the division of Germany. It included free elections of the, in the GDR, political and economic cooperation, the creation of confederate structures between the two German states. And as I said, it was very confidential, very sensitive. So he wouldn't even have his office have a look at this plan. He does, as a matter of fact, asked his wife to, to type it. And now I have a small prop that I prepared for this event today. Uh, so for a younger audience, my question is, does anybody know what this is? Well, probably you wouldn't know this is a typewriter, but the special speciality of this typewriter that I just showed you is that it's actually a 1950s typewriter, a travel model Olympia. I can mention this because the, com the, the company is no longer in business. And this is exactly the typewriter that the wife of Helmut Kohl at the time used to type this 10 point plan of Helmut Kohl. That's what I read. So that's why I particularly treasure this. Um, typewriter, which I've had now for, for a long time. Now, the developments in GDR, there were elections to the Volkskammer in March 1990. There was a draft constitution and immediately the Stasi, which was a secret service, which was the key element of oppression at the time, as many would know, was dissolved. On January 15, 1990, the demonstrators uh, in East Berlin occupied the Stasi building and on 18 March 1990 the first free elections in the GDR took place and the, the government for CDU as a conservative party led government by uh, Prime Minister de Maizière took over uh, in uh, in March 1990 and de Maizière already committed the government of the GDR to accede to the Federal Republic of Germany which was West Germany at the time. On 1st of July 1990, um, the GDR assumed large parts of the economic and legal system of West Germany, and that also meant to introduce the Deutsche Mark, our currency. Now the question obviously was which exchange rate will be used for this currency, because the uh, economic the economy of the GDR was extremely weak. And so from the economic point of view, it would not make no sense at all to exchange it one on one. But as a political decision, uh, the government decided it should actually be one to one and in, in the, at uh, larger amounts than it changed to one to two. But the basic exchange was one on one, which was a highly political and very poor decision. And on 23rd of August 1990, the Volkskammer voted in favor of acceding to West Germany with effect of October 3rd, 1990. So practically exactly 30 years ago, 
as well as to exceed the scope of the basic law, which is our constitution. Now, particularly important in this framework of the World Affairs Council, uh, the International Framework of International of German Unification in December 1989, uh, the heads of state of the EU uh, agreed to Germany's unification in February 90, 1990. Gorbachev, the uh, leader of the Soviet Union, agreed to German unification. That was, of course, the most important agreement in this process. In April 1990, EU members agreed unanimously uh, towards unification at a special summit. And then we started the, the process of the so-called two plus four negotiations, two may standing for the two Germanys and four for the occupying uh, forces, uh, France, UK, Soviet Union and the United States. They had four meetings in Bonn, Berlin, Paris and Moscow between May and September in 1990. And on 12th September in Moscow, they signed this very important treaty. Um, there were discussions on the NATO membership of United Germany, which Gorbachev eventually accepted during the visit of Helmut Kohl to the Caucasus in mid-July 1990. And at the same time, they found an agreement on the withdrawal of the Soviet troops from East German territory. The treaty, uh, the two plus four treaty, entered into force in 1991. Uh, and the victorious powers at the time then relinquished their rights and responsibilities in Germany and Germany received its full sovereignty back. So this was a final agreement on German borders and Germany on the other side had to forego nuclear, biological and chemical weapons, also part of the treaty. And there was also an agreement on the uh, quite substantial reduction of uh, German troops, the Bundeswehr and the uh, National Volksarmee, the National People's Army of the GDR, which was uh, relatively big given the small size of the GDR. So both had to be, uh, had to be reduced. Um, so um, the, after 40 years of division in, uh, on 3rd of October 1990, Germany eventually was reunified. And on 2nd December 1990, we elected a shared parliament and Helmut Kohl became the first chancellor of United Germany. Uh, the Russian and the Western troops were withdrawn in 94 for good on 31st of August and 8th September 94. And uh, I would like now to switch to my third point, which is the reconstruction of East Germany. So you have to realize, and uh, perhaps not everybody knows, but the uh, economy of East Germany was in a very, very bad shape. They would say that less than 10% 10, 10 of the companies at the time were internationally competitive. They were all geared towards Comic-Con, to the Eastern economic bloc, but there was no competitiveness compared to the world markets. So the trouble was that practically 90% of the production capacity of East Germany had to be shut down one way or another, especially in smaller structures or starting from scratch. So there was a huge effort to be handled by Trojan, the special institution in East Germany at the time. Uh, and financially, it was covered basically by, by West German funds. Uh, West Germany transferred about 100 billion uh, Deutschmark annually, uh, adding up now to, I would say, way over 1 trillion euros over time that went as transfers from West to the East to reconstruct or to construct uh, Eastern Germany. Uh, and the one other important thing that many people uh, do not remember anymore, but in 1990, 1991, it was decided to move our parliament, the Bundestag, from Bonn to Berlin by the end of 1999, so in within eight years. But you also have to realize, again, and that's the thing that's not so well remembered uh, abroad, Bonn is still the second seat of government um, with a very large uh, uh, departments or, or ministries still in Bonn, uh, like defense, agriculture, science, research, environment, etc. They only have offices in Berlin, but the main seat officially is Bonn, though admittedly the, um, the ministers, uh, the secretaries, they are in Berlin, obviously, but the largest number of staff is still in, in Bonn. And I believe at least until recently, the overall number of uh, officers in Bonn, actually our officials in Bonn actually was still a little uh, bigger than in Berlin, but maybe that has changed in the, the past few years. Uh, now to um, just a few more words on, on the, the reconstruction of, of East Germany. 
Uh, the idea obviously was to move East German living conditions to West German levels. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are standing about uh, a little above 80%, uh, which is a success story if you uh, consider where we came from. And you particularly see it when you visit East Germany. I can strongly remand, re re recommend if you haven't done so. It's a beautiful area. There's so much history, so many interesting, fascinating places. Uh, what you will really find to admire is the very modern, good infrastructure in, in traffic and city planning. The environmental protection has been a huge success story as well. That includes waste management. Water protection worked very well. They have many institutions in research, development, etc. As I said, it was uh, the finance mainly came through Western sources. Um, uh, every uh, everybody in Germany has to pay a solidarity surcharge on the income tax, but that also actually applies to East German citizens. Um, so the idea is to prevent uh, German, Eastern Germany uh, being um, decoupled from West Germany, to prevent it to become a, a new mezzogiorno or so, some area which really needs a lot of support. Uh, and I believe that went very, very well. Uh, now, final point of my uh, little expose is uh, that the is the political, social, uh, social political aspects of the matter. Uh, some media still like uh, to talk about the so-called wall in the heads, which still is supposed to exist. Uh, I I doubt it. Uh, I, obviously, there are uh, still some people who uh, are not happy with the situation, um, which which is true. But as as I said, the living conditions have improved so much uh, over time that the overwhelming majority of Germans see reunification as, as a blessing. Uh, just last month, we had a, the latest report on the German unity, uh, confirming that uh, there was great progress in the areas that I was just mentioned, plus also in health, in childcare, and in social security, uh, so on top of what I just mentioned. Meaning that the East German economy has more than quadrupled, since the reunification. Uh, obviously, there are still deficits. Um, when you compare uh, the number of East German executives, for example, in uh, companies, in uh, the bureaucracy, etc., it's a, it's a small percentage. Uh, sometimes uh, I hear that even uh, there's no, no president of uh, an East German university with an East German background. So this is definitely a situation that we have to remedy. Um, no doubt about it. Um, there's now, we will have a, a, disc, uh, a monument on German unity in the center of Berlin, uh, which is called the, uh, the Citizens in Nation, which will be presented very soon. Um, uh, the, one of the problems that I'd just uh, like, briefly like to raise is that in East Germany, there is a, a bit of a problem of the perception of democracy so it would, uh, in, in polls, only 40% of uh, those interviewed would approve of democracy as the best uh, situation. Um, so that, that needs to be remedied as well. And the question is, why would that be? Why would the East Germans, uh, as distinct from the West Germans, to a much larger degree, vote for right-wing populist parties like the AFD? Um, uh, the, there are certain psychological or sociological explanations. Um, uh, like Abstiegsängste, as we call it, this is the fear of loss of status that might contribute. Um, it, that happened maybe already in, uh, during the change in, in 1989, 1990, uh, but it uh, probably would not have been really swallowed or not really overcome. And some uh, politicians nowadays say that it really broke out right now, 30 years later also accompanied by certain aggression against foreigners. Uh, we have to also admit that this phenomenon is more spread in East Germany than in West Germany. There were right-wing terrorist group, the so-called NSU, or the Gruppe Freitag in uh, Saxony, Freital in Saxony, uh, which committed right-wing crimes. Uh, that has to be resolved as well. Now the question was the solution to this uh, situation. The solution is simply that we have to manage to relay more democracy messages, uh, what we call democratie competence, um, uh, containing a lot of uh, aspects of political 
education on many levels. And the other thing that I, I also always stress uh, on this occasion is that um, we have to better recognize the lifetime achievements of uh, Eastern German citizens, especially older citizens, my generation and older, because obviously when the wall came down and their companies, their livelihoods basically were uh, dismantled, uh, so they would have asked, what have I worked for in the past 40 years? So their lifetime achievements, they felt were not recognized uh, and we have to find a solution to that as well. So, so because they also contributed um, admittedly to the wrong system, but uh, they, they made their efforts. So this is a psychological or political, so sociological and psychological issue that we have to deal with as well. Um, but uh, one word also on, on COVID-19, our uh, most current, most topical issue. Um, uh, I would state that uh, in, in East Germany, actually there's less, uh, there are less infections than in West Germany. You know that the overall numbers of the infections in Germany are very low compared to other Western countries. They're the lowest among the, the, the bigger, the larger Western countries by far. Yesterday, there was an uptick. Uh, we had, yesterday, we had 4,000 new infection, infections, but normally it ranged between one and 2,000 daily, uh, which is a, by international comparison, very low numbers. And the number of deaths also is way up, uh, below the average Western level. Uh, so the infections in Eastern Germany are even below the Western and the general standards in Eastern Germany. And uh, here, the state in the north, which is called Mecklenburg-Antepomerania, we call it Mecklenburg-Vorpommern or Meckpom in, in Germany, uh, is number one there. In the positive sense, they have uh, uh, a dozen or less infections, uh, new infections every day with a population of, I believe, two to three million. So that is quite, quite impressive. And maybe we discuss that later. I, I, I think that, uh, uh, JJ, you have this also on your agenda as a, uh, as a topic. So just to conclude, uh, let me just state that uh, German unity is a success story uh, brought about by the peaceful um, revolution of East German citizens. And at the same time, it's worthwhile acknowledging that the trust and friendship of our Western partners and above all, the United States really helped us in uniting. Without them, it would not have been possible. And in that case, I'm super proud to serve in Texas because as you know, there were two Texans who really helped us, President Bush and Secretary Baker. And on that note, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Council General Meister. Um, what a great presentation. Uh, and I think a very appropriate way to kind of um, segue into uh, you know, the American-German uh, friendship theme uh, that's part of what we wanted to talk about today. Uh, and uh, we do have one question though from the audience uh, from your presentation that I'd like to ask. And it is, what was the cultural shift after the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall? Were there people on both sides uh, that were receptive of the change? And that could be asked a different way. Was there anyone that wasn't? Uh, yes, uh, obviously the majority went uh, along well with the way we did the uh, unification, which was uh, East Germany exceeding to West Germany. But uh, there were others who said, okay, no, we have achieved quite a lot here in East Germany, so we want to see more of it. And let's be it a kind of one-on-one -on -one unification, not Germany, East Germany exceeding to the Western German system. Uh, I do remember this, uh, these groups, they, they used to say, uh, kein Anschluss unter dieser Nummer, meaning uh, there's no connection under this phone, uh, but they were referring to an article in our basic law, which um, was drawn upon to justify our unification. So they were not so happy with this uh, situation, but this was a minority, the majority really uh, uh, was in favor of uh, the, the way we did it. And I mean, culturally, if you go to the, the mere aspect of cultures, uh, I think the, German, the, the whole of Germany, unified Germany has been enriched extremely by, by uh, the unification, because if you look at what culture in East Germany offers, the, uh, from the Gewandhaus Orchestra in Leipzig uh, to, the, uh, to the famous uh, uh, comedy places like the Distel, 
in East Berlin or, or the, the museums or the, the Baroque city of Dresden. Uh, the, there are so, so many world cultural heritage places like Stralsund, Wismar, Quedlinburg, beautiful medieval places, uh, which uh, I personally obviously didn't know because we didn't have a chance to, to travel there. So I used to say, well, I know my previous postings like Australia and New Zealand, and uh, so a lot better than, than parts of East Germany and Saxony and Saxony-Anhalt. So that was a beautiful enrichment for us. Great, thank you very much, sir. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to, to, to move to Colonel Jameson Braun, uh, former senior advisor to the UCOM ambassador and chief of staff as well. Um, Jameson, in your pos position, I know you spent uh, a total of something like 14 years in Germany and, and quite a few of those uh, operating at a pretty high level uh, and certainly in a position where um, the important geopolitical and political military uh, decisions and, and situations and issues of, of the day and of the future, strategically speaking, uh, were go coming across your desk. And uh, I think you were able to um, view uh, what was going on with the decision making and the analysis of those things from both the, the US perspective uh, and, and also from the German perspective. And I think that uh, these things um, tie in uh, very um, aptly into the discussion of the transatlantic relationship, not only between the United States and Germany, but regionally uh, for Germany in the EU and, and that larger relationship between the United States uh, and the European Union. So with that, I'd like to give you the floor and, to, and, and uh, give you the opportunity to talk about some of those uh, themes and, and issues that you think uh, are, are impacting uh, Germany and, and those relationships right now and have in the recent past. Uh, thank you, JJ. Thanks to the uh, panel. Vielen Dank, Consul General Meister. You know, it's, uh, it's only through 30 years of unity in our land's long-standing partnership with a great country and the people of Germany uh, that we can jump into and have this more mature and meaty dialogue on where we are now and, and where we focus together in the future. You know, Germany continues to assume uh, greater diplomatic, security, and economic responsibilities, particularly as it continues its 2019-2020 UN Security Council term, and it's finishing up its six-month EU Council presidency running through December of this year. And in the past weeks, uh, specifically in August, right, the German government took on an active role mediating uh, the tensions that existed between Turkey and Greece in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, within the EU and implementing sanctions against Belarus and through ongoing uh, the Berlin process for Libya. Uh, Germany's efforts uh, to contain the spread of COVID-19 that we previously talked about appear extremely effective. Chancellor Merkel uh, has received a boost in popularity uh, due to the government's handling of the virus. And I'll, I'll advocate that significant progress is being made on core policy priorities uh, for the partnership between US and Germany. Uh, these include, and we'll talk about just a couple of them, uh, increasing defense spending and military capabilities, countering the influence of China and Russia, rebalancing trade, uh, banning Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, which it did in April, uh, which was pretty uh, foundational, uh, as well as modernizing its own national security apparatus. When we talk about partnership, I think it's important to always reiterate too uh, that, that Germany doesn't do this alone, uh, that Germany is home to more than 120,000 registered US citizens uh, not counting over about 40,000 U.S. military personnel on U.S. bases, um, as well as their families. Uh, Germany's response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was internationally recognized, as Consul General Meister uh, mentioned, especially for the relatively low mortality rate. And while we believe that the German government is cautious to do a victory lap until there's finally a vaccine, its attributes to success uh, include things like early and wide testing of individuals, aggressive contract tracing, widespread adherence to social distancing, and mask wearing, and sufficient capacity in its healthcare system. These are all huge lessons learned, I think, for the international community to take hold of as Germany really sits in that geographical nexus of the European continent. And its ability to contain this was really fundamental for, I think, the rest of the global stage. I'd like to shift a little bit to increasing defense spending, which is one of our highest priorities 
And particularly, right, it's a relationship that the U.S. has with Germany to make good on its 2014 Wales Defense Investment Pledge Commitment. Significantly, at the beginning of this year, Defense Minister uh, Kram Kernbauer of the CDU uh, called publicly for Germany to reach 2% of GDP by 2031 at the latest, the first time a leading politician has endorsed a concrete date to reach the target. The proposal has not yet been endorsed by the cabinet or parliament, and Germany's latest submissions to NATO commit only 1.42% of GDP in 2020 and 1.5% by 2024. The German government does, however, remain extremely vocal and active in its opposition to Russia's incursion in Eastern Ukraine and the illegal occupation of Crimea, two areas that are fundamental to our continued relationship and promoting security and the dialogue that ensues. Germany is a key partner in leading efforts to find a diplomatic solution to the crisis in Ukraine through the Normandy format discussions. Those include Germany, France, Ukraine, and Russia. However, German officials continue to support Gazprom's Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. So if the Gazprom Nord Stream pipeline continues to push through, it gives double the amount of Russian gas flow directly to Germany, bypassing Ukraine and Poland. And we see it is a, it's at the heart a geopolitical project entirely owned by Gazprom and directed by Russian leadership, which continues to be an issue uh, for us in the United States. With regard to rebalancing trade, uh, Germany's export-driven economy consistently runs the world's largest current account surplus. So this, we think, directly contributed by its issuing of the Kurzarbeit, uh, the $293 billion in 2019, and has a large, and Germany maintains a large good trade surplus with the United States. Since 2015, the United States has been Germany's largest export market, while China is its largest source of imports, which also creates a small nexus issue uh, as you've seen in our national defense strategy plans, uh, that, that China is a, is, a, is a major, it's the number one national security concern for the United States. Investment ties with the United States remain crucial. Germany has invested a cumulative $522 billion in the United States on a beneficial ownership basis and employed in 2017 almost 780,000 U.S. workers. The current numbers uh, we think are closer to a million when we looked at the 2000 and 2019, 2020, but they've yet to be published. And almost 40% of those jobs come in the form of the manufacturing sector. So very important when we talk about how do we maintain and, and build those relationship ties. Last, I'd like to talk about Germany's role in the transatlantic alliance, the United Nations and the European Union. Germany is a key contributor to NATO missions, including being a framework nation in Lithuania for enhanced forward presence. This continues to place in the minds, especially of the younger generation, of the reality of the near peer competitor immediately to our east. Germany is also a framework nation, the second largest computer, er, contributor to the NATO Resolute Support Mission, where it currently has 1,300 troops stationed in northern Afghanistan. Germany continues to press us for greater detail on U.S. conditions for drawdown, and we're collecting, like, collectively excuse me, making strides in this arena. Germany was a fantastic host this year to the largest military mobility exercises on the continent called Defender Europe 2020, and will be one of the largest hosts for next year, Defender Europe 2021, involving participants from 22 partner nations and allies. Largely, people to people ties remain absolutely robust between our, our two countries, including one of the largest Fulbright programs and the United States largest bilateral youth exchange program the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange, which annually gives over 700 young Germans and Americans the opportunity to spend an academic year in each other's country. Alumni of the US government exchange programs currently account for over 10% of the German Bundestag. So with that, I'd like to get off the stage. I'd like to commend Consul General Meister uh, for being representative of the unification of the partnership and longstanding commitment that we have with each other's countries and I look forward to the continued dialogue moving forward. Thanks, JJ. All right, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Braun. Uh, thank you both. Um, we don't have a whole lot of questions coming in, uh, so I'm going to uh, ask a couple myself. Um, I know I, I, when I was at the U.S. Embassy from 2009 to 2012, um, there were some uh, kind of um, singular um, topics that uh, that didn't go away, at least while I was there. One was, uh, uh, you know, the uh, 
German troops in Afghanistan. Of course, the United States was pushing for Germany and, and other countries to, to contribute. And that was, uh, that was a big one. Uh, General Petraeus came through a couple of times um, to, to make visits in Berlin um, to, to try to, uh, you know, get, get a, as good a, a relationship between the Bundestag, Bundestag and, the, and the Department of Defense as possible to, to make that happen. The other, the other big thing was uh, missile defense. And uh, that continues to be, um, I think, a major issue both regionally and globally. Um, and was wondering, uh, Jameson, if you had uh, anything to add with respect to missile defense and, um, and the, rec the recent um, communications coming from uh, Russia on, on the, the uh, advancements that we've made in, in Europe on that issue. Sure. So to your first question, right, we'll talk about Germany just as, a, as, as one of the elemental members of uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the roles and responsibilities. Um, so every country is being pushed to maintain a level of parity and equity in its contributions uh, for all global security. And, and Afghanistan is just unfortunately one of those locations, as is, you know, the Middle East and the sub-med and right, protecting the Western areas of, of, of Europe writ large. Uh, one of the larger issues that we're having, though, is we have aging populations uh, now that we've started to, to flourish to the West um, and younger birth rates. So Germany is one of those countries that's having problems recruiting a younger generation uh, to serve. And it no longer has the draft like it previously had. Uh, they got rid of it a couple years ago. So even that compulsory level of service um, is, is less in the forefront of the German population as it was previously. Uh, so we're working together on that. Uh, the second point relative to it is because Germany is kind of in that landlocked area between uh, growing and evolving democracies, uh, the, the population and the government writ large really don't see uh, our, our near peers to the east as a, as a pervasive threat. They believe that that threat is encumbered by, you know, our, our, our partner allies in the Baltics um, and, you know, largely Poland and that, that, that it will be their responsibility to shield uh, a, an offensive posture should one come from our near peer to the east. Uh, so that becomes an issue. Uh, that then all parlays itself into the idea of missile defense. When we talk about growing and stimulating economies, right, nothing tends to drag that down further than spending money on defense apparatus that you firmly don't believe that you need. Um, so there's very little talk today on missile defense, except for when it comes to, you know, Ambassador Mossbacher's crew and, and, and Poland. And, you know, from Poland's perspective, we can never get enough. The further east, the better. Uh, but there's that standoff competition that we'd like to, uh, you know, also avoid, uh, not necessarily to poke the bear if you can just make the bear kind of adhere to where you're at. So, Council Meister, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for, for your excellent presentation. I would agree 98% with what you said. Uh, let me just talk on the 2%, uh, which uh, you mentioned, starting maybe with, uh, with Nord Stream 2. So, our position on, on that issue is, uh, you know, we are we're having the energy turnaround, the energy transition, meaning that we, have, we are switching off our nuclear power as well as our coal power. So we need new sources of energy. And our companies, they said, okay, we uh, would like to go for more gas. Now we have def different choices for gas, and one of those choices is Russian gas. Uh, and we need, uh, according to their calculations, about 30 to 40% more gas in the few uh, years to come. And that's why they decided in favor of the second the North Stream pipeline, um, which uh, does not hurt actually the the transfer through um, Ukraine and Poland because there was a trilateral agreement between uh, Brussels, the EU, uh, and uh, supported by Germany, Ukraine, and Russia to maintain this flow. So it wouldn't hurt uh, Russia, it wouldn't hurt Poland or Ukraine. And also within Europe, uh, there were initially some problems, but now then we had the gas directive. So there's a complicated system of gas storage, reverse flow, etc., which secures the gas supplies to our uh, Central European uh, friends as well. So there's no, no problem on that. And 
mind you, not very well known, but Germany has had these uh, gas relations with Russia now for over 50 years. It started in the, the early 70s, and in 50 years, even at the height of the civil war, at the beginning of the Afghanistan war, there has never been an interruption of supplies. So we don't see any major supply problems either. Obviously, we are also looking at a, a US LNG, and there's, as you know, discussion on the LNG terminals at the Baltic Sea that I mentioned before when I talked about uh, mecklenburg vorpommern but then it, that has to be competitive. At this stage, uh, my understanding is that the, uh, the LNG is a little too expensive, about 20 to 30 percent more expensive than Russian pipeline gas. So that has to be to be met as well. On the uh, defense issue, uh, two per percent, yeah, the, the, the target indeed from Wales was to have two percent uh, GDP expenditure on, on defense by 2024. Uh, now, the very latest news that I actually got yesterday is that Germany for 2020 will arrive at 1.56%, which is not so bad after all. It means that we have a, about a 50 to 60% increase already over 2014 when this agreement was made in Wales, and this is some, some progress, but uh, there's still room for, for improvement that, that I would acknowledge. And, and on the trade issue, uh, you know, we are all, particularly look at the European American trade. And there's an imbalance of say 150 billion uh, euros or no, dollars, I believe it is dollars, uh, in, in favor of EU on the, on the current account. But if you in, include the services, this shrinks to 100 billion. And if you include the, uh, the uh, primary income by Google, Facebook, and all the other internet companies, it's zero. It's a completely balanced trade. So actually, if you look at it uh, from the meta perspective, there is no no imbalance between the United States and Europe. Uh, if you go more into the detail, you look at Holland, America, Germany, America, then it's different. But the European, um, uh, American trade and business relationships are pretty, pretty balanced. And then Afghanistan, um, uh, you know, Germany has been in Afghanistan now for, for 18 years. Um, and this is since the war of 13 years, 1648, 1618 to 48, the longest war Germany has been engaged. Um, I think our troops have done a good, good job there, and it was quite an effort to, to bring them over. And as you mentioned, Germany is also engaged in many other parts of the world, from Mali to Lithuania, you know, America, United States protecting Poland, uh, Germany is in Lithuania, and I forgot about Estonia. And, uh, uh, Latonia, but there, there, there is a division of, of work which works quite well and I think it's quite subtle, quite balanced as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Consul General Meister and uh, Colonel Braun. Um, we have uh, one question that kind of uh, backpedals us to coronavirus, uh, but it's a little more specific uh, uh, about how, what has been the effect of uh, the coronavirus and Germany's, uh, with respect to Germany's response in universities. So this is an education question, but specific to universities. I, I know here in the United States, um, it has been um, state by state, really, the approach that uh, has been taken with universities. Uh, for instance, here in um, Texas, uh, my son goes to Texas A&M University and uh, most of his classes are virtual. However, there are a couple that, uh, two or three that, that uh, he uh, attends in person, socially distanced, wearing a mask, no partners, uh, that sort of uh, thing. Um, but uh, what are they doing in Germany? I'm not 100% familiar with the, the current situation, but what I hear uh, from my daughter, her friends, etc. She studies in the Netherlands, has many friends uh, as well in, in Germany, is that they are all more or less following some kind of hybrid models. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, online uh, experience still, uh, and they're all a little disappointed, obviously, because they can't return to their, their full uh, system. But you know, you really have to, to balance it. And, and if it's in favor of uh, public health, then we all have to, to sacrifice so much. And that also, unfortunately, includes our our universities. Uh, thank God we do have the, the online experience, but uh, my personal um, belief is that it can obviously not fully um, compensate for what we're losing through direct 
uh, context. And also, if you see it from the perspective of the the the, the university tutors, the the, uh, the from the point of tuition, it is also not not easy for for a professor to project your program vis-a-vis uh, -vis an electronic audience, so to speak. Right? It's much better to have a, a presence in presence or uh, in person audience than than the new ways. But what what you do, I think, is we're all in the same situation on that. Not much of a difference. Yeah. So I, I know uh, we do have one person in the audience, Anne Julia Hagen, uh, who is attending the University of Potsdam. She's pursuing her PhD. And uh, uh, it's just uh, fortuitous that uh, I, I reconnected with her just a couple hours before this program and told her she should join. Um, I actually was uh, friends with her father, who's a Oberst or a Colonel. Uh, in the Luftwaffe, and this coffee cup, which is on my desk right now, is a gift from him uh, to me while I was working in Berlin. So, um, so Julia, uh, Anne Julia, if you have a, uh, any input on that, I know you are attending virtually, however, but if you do, um, you could drop your comment into the, uh, the Q&A window. Um, so with that, I think we need to start transitioning uh, back uh, to Armin, uh, but before we do, uh, I wanted to uh, give both of our panelists, first of all, a big uh, thank you for uh, doing this today. Um, two very well respected, very well accomplished um, and knowledgeable uh, uh, panelists today to uh, talk about not only um, Unity Day and uh, American-German uh, friendship, uh, but also um, some of the historical context, uh, the socio-political aspects of those things, and uh, some of the more recent issues that uh, are affecting the, the Germany regionally, as well as that transatlantic partnership. Um, so with that, um, Jameson, uh, do you have anything that you want to add before we break off? No, I'd just like to thank uh, Consul General Meister, obviously the, uh, the German Republic, uh, for for continuing the dialogue that we have with the United States, and you know we we, we have lots of flex factors, right? Uh, Secretary Esper's announcement that we're going to withdraw, you know, some of the troops recently and reposition those throughout the European, uh, but the resolve was not lost uh, between our two governments that collectively uh, we are responsible for the continued security and prosperity of the Western democracies, especially right in in, in Germany and throughout Western Europe. Uh, so I'd like to commend you and thank you for continuing that brotherhood, uh, that fellowship, and, and, and that continued movement forward. Thanks, JJ. All right. Thank you, Colonel Braun. And uh, Consul General Meister, any closing comments? Yes. So thank you again for organizing. A big thank you to all of you uh, for, for helping to bring about this, this project. Um, the, uh, just let, let me uh, wind back briefly to, to President Bush. When he was in Germany in 1990, he proposed uh, partnership in leadership for Germany. And uh, on, on Tuesday at our discussion at the Baker Institute, I referred to Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, the, she said uh, when she attended George Bush's funeral in uh, the event in Washington in 2018, uh, she said, without President Bush, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to, as an East German citizen become the, the leader of United Germany. So, so on that note, I'd like to conclude and also uh, thank you to, to Armin for organizing this event and the, um, uh, just the background, Wunderbar, Wunderbar Together has been an activity for over a year in the entire United States, the largest of its kind so far. We had those activities worldwide. Uh, this were 2,500 events uh, with public life, with uh, civil society, with government, with regions. And it's just wonderful to, to put another uh, stone into the mosaic of this Wunderbar Together event that we had last year, the Wunderbar Jahr of Wunderbar, the Germany, the year of Germany in the United States. On that note, thank you. Thank you so much, Consul General Thomas Meister, Colonel Jameson Braun. Thank you everyone for attending. I, I'm going to hand it over to Armin, uh, who has some uh, administrative closing comments. Uh, so please uh, hang on for those. Armin. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, appreciate all of you. I'll be very quick. 
thank you so much for accepting to be part of this program. We, we do. Uh, a quick note, Consul General Meister, uh, one of our board members, Sherry Dolat Shahi, uh, had said in the comments that, uh, welcome back to San Antonio, virtually at least. Um, and she was actually the first one introduced us uh, uh, about a year ago. So I'm glad exactly. to see you again. Uh, Jameson, thank you for uh, 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 communicating back. And, and while you were in Germany and you were trying to figure out how to do this and uh, and now you're in San Antonio. So it's, I look forward to working with you as you uh, make San Antonio your home. JJ, as always, uh, it's uh, wonderful to have you moderate uh, reason we ask you is because you do a good job of it. So that's why we keep asking you. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, really appreciate the World Affairs Councils of America. Like I said earlier, the program was hosted in partnership with Wunderbar Tech together in the World Affairs Councils of America. Um, if you go to the uh, World Affairs Councils of Affairs uh, of America, uh, you will see the other programs um, taking place in the month of October. Uh, we're honored to have the Consul General here as a friend and uh, you're welcome back uh, anytime you want. Um, and uh, with that, if you have any questions about the World Affairs Council, uh, please check us out on our website. Uh, please uh, uh, look at all the different opportunities for membership. Uh, those links are coming up and we'd love to for you to consider make a gift that is important and an amount that is important to you. Uh, uh, we really appreciate that support. Uh, we do this because of viewers like you and also on Facebook. Thank you for tuning in. And, um, and we will see you all tomorrow. We have a program on Azerbaijan with the conflict that is going on there between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So we will see you tomorrow. Uh, other than that, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support for the World Affairs Council. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.